me as we read God's Word. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Thank you, Andy. Good morning, people of grace. Oh my goodness, that sounded like a post-Easter uh, greeting there. Uh, let's, let's pretend it's Easter Sunday again, since we're gonna talk about the resurrection some more. Good morning, people of grace. All right, thank you. I've heard people say when a preacher asks you to do that more than a couple times, it's really his own insecurities. Uh, that he's not really worried about you not um, being loud enough. He's really worried about how he's going to do. So I've heard that about other preachers, of course. But anyway, I'm glad you're with us this morning. It's good to see guests with us, and we're, we're so glad to have you and pray that uh, this will be a time of blessing for you and, of course, for all of us regular folks as well. So, back in the 1960s, there were four young, long-haired teenage boys in Liverpool, England, who started a little band that began gathering some attention in their area and soon they were creating a sensation across the globe. They came up with a name for themselves, uh, creatively called themselves the Beatles, as you know. Their music and their song titles were known to be creative, at least for the time, but they were really just a bunch of teenage boys. And as their popularity grew, and they began to play different concerts here and there, and then uh, recorded their first album or two, they realized that they had to keep writing songs and keep the crowds entertained. It was more than they really expected. Their song titles at that time weren't very deep or very profound. They had such great titles as, I want to hold your hand, or a hard day's night, or the very creative title, Eight Days a Week. There's a story about that song in particular, Eight Days a Week that tells how these boys came up with the title. Paul McCartney 
tells about getting into a limousine in London. He had now gotten to the point where he could afford a limousine, a limousine ride, and the driver picked him up to take him to John Lennon's house up north of London, where they were going to work on some music. And when Paul got into the limo, he greeted the driver and asked, how are you doing? And the driver said, oh, I'm working hard, man, working eight days a week. Paul thought that was funny. He had never heard that expression before. And he also wondered, just how hard does a limousine driver work? He just drives people around. But when he got to Lennon's house, he told him what the driver had said, and John Lennon said, hey, we can make a song out of that. And so they did. A very deep and profound song that goes, oh, I need your love, babe. Guess you know it's true. Hope you need my love, babe, just like I need you. Hold me, love me, hold me, love me. Ain't got nothing but love, babe eight days a week. As I said, it was deep and profound. So what does that have to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? You might be asking. Well, it's because here in John 20, we are actually going to see the continuing part, uh, the story of Jesus' resurrection. And it is described believe it or not, as an eight-day week. In verse 1 of chapter 20, I encourage you to turn in your Bibles, if you haven't already, to John chapter 20 to be able to follow along. We're going to be looking at the second half of the chapter, which Andy just read, starting in verse 19. But notice first, in verse 1 of chapter 20, John tells us that on the first day of the week, which is Sunday after the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark. Verses 1 to 18, which we dealt with last week, describe the events of that day. When we get to verse 19, where Andy began reading, it's now Sunday night, and John tells us that Jesus came into the room where the disciples were hiding to present himself to them. In verses 19 to 23, Jesus shows them his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoice that he is truly alive. But there is someone who is missing, Thomas for some reason, is absent. What a time to miss a meeting, Thomas. The disciples try their best to convince their buddy a little bit later that they truly saw the Lord, but Thomas isn't buying it. He says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, place my hand into his side, I will never believe. So John tells us again in verse 26 that eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Because of the way that Jews count days, with the first day being included, this is the next Sunday, one week after Easter. It's two Sundays with six days in the middle. It's an eight-day week. So the Beatles had it right. It was really a profoundly deep song after all. Last week's sermon was called The Tomb Was Not Empty, based on the fact that there was evidence in the tomb. We talked about how there were linen cloths and the head cloth was, the face cloth was folded neatly. Grave robbers would not go to the 
take the time to do such a thing if they were stealing the body. There was evidence in the tomb. There were also angels in the tomb giving witness to Mary and to the other women. There were two male witnesses. We talked about how in a Jewish court you had to have two male witnesses. And Peter and John come into the tomb and witness later to the point of Peter's death and John's um, being placed in captivity, um, in isolation for being a witness of Jesus. But they went, as all the disciples did, to extreme measures. All the other disciples were killed for their belief and their witness for the truth of the resurrection. The tomb was not empty. There was evidence, and we talked about that last week, how important that is in the story. So in your bulletin, if you happen to look at uh, the sermon title, it says the tomb was not empty part two, a very creative and profound title uh, from me, by the way. And there's a reason why it says that, but the real title today is eight days a week. This week, we worked ahead and put the bulletin on, uh, together on Thursday. And on Friday, as I was reviewing over this, I, I came across this idea that this is an eight-day week. And it just shows that it's better to procrastinate till Friday to do things like the bulletin instead of Thursday. But anyway, that's the title for today, Eight Days a Week. But seriously, John wants us to know that this eight-day week is very significant. It's quite significant that Thomas wasn't there on the first Sunday night. His absence gives us another opportunity, a second opportunity, to examine the evidence. Thomas, who is usually in the background a little bit, becomes the ultimate spokesperson for the certainty of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He moves from being this negative figure that we often think he is to being exclamatory in his praise for what he sees at the end of the story. He moves from disbelief to belief. He moves from being skeptical Thomas to being worshipful Thomas. He is no longer doubting Thomas, but he's actually shouting Thomas at the end of this story. What I want us to see this morning is that the evidence of Jesus' resurrection gives us assurance for ourselves. But it also gives us a sure message to share with others. The evidence for Jesus' resurrection, which is profound, gives us assurance for ourselves in our own belief, but it also gives us a sure message to share with others. So what I'd like to do this morning is break this story down between these two Sundays, Easter Sunday and the next Sunday. We don't mu know much about all the Sick, uh, much at all about the six days in between the two Sundays. But these two days are packed with encouragement and assurance that this is worth living for. This is worth going to your death for, like these 11 of the 12 men did. Do you remember last week, if you were here, we talked about how John and Peter raced to the tomb and John beats Peter there, and it says he stooped to look inside and saw the linen cloths lying there, but was hesitant to go in. But then Peter came and burst right in, as he typically did. He runs into the uh, tomb, and it says he saw the linen cloths and the faith's cloth. And then we're told that John came into the tomb and he saw and believed. Three times there in these three verses, 
John uses the word Saul in English. But in Greek, these are three different words. And we've talked about how John loves to play with words, with puns and little, um, little word plays. He loves to compare and contrast similar words to help us see what's really going on. We've talked about how John brings characters all through his gospel. He brings characters out onto the stage from the very beginning of the book. John the baptizer comes out and gives us his story of his encounter with Jesus. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then one by one, John brings in the disciples to the story who are following John the baptizer, but then they begin to tell the story. And we've talked about how the audience is us. We are reading the story, but John is telling it to us like we're sitting in the audience. And so the disciples say things like, come and see who this man is. And then we begin to get other people in the story like Nicodemus, who's a Jewish rabbi, who comes to Jesus and hears, you must be born again. And then this woman at the well, who is the exact opposite of Nicodemus, her story is, come and see this man who told me everything I've done. He offered me living water. Well, now we're at the tail end of the story. And John is once again inviting us in. And he does it with these three words because each word is different in Greek, and I won't go into all the pronunciations, but each one is more intense. And it's like John is calling out to us in the audience, don't miss this. I want you to come and look further in. At first, I ran into the tomb and I stooped to look down and I saw these cloths. It's the word that means to glance at something, to just notice it. But after that, Peter comes right in and busts past me. He goes into the tomb and he sees the cloths with some reflection. He wonders about this. And so then I went in, in verse 8, and I saw and believed. That third word, saw, is the word that means to see with perceiving, with perception, with understanding. We don't know how much John believed or what he believed because the next verse goes on to say that they didn't understand the scriptures that talked about the resurrection. So it's still cloudy, but John is saying, I want you to do what John and Peter did. Come in and check out the evidence. It's strong. It's worth believing. That's what's going on here. So last week when we said the tomb was not empty, we talked a lot about the evidence. But today, we want to take it a little bit further. We want to not only look closely with a magnifying glass at this evidence, but we want to be encouraged and assured by it in our own hearts. This is really true. This is worth committing my life to. This is worth believing. This is worth dying for. But we also want to look and say, if this is so important, I need to share it with others. So let's look back at day one, the first Sunday, Easter Sunday morning. The first thing you notice in the description here in John and in the other Gospels is that this Easter morning day is a day of chaos and confusion. It's a day of chaos and confusion. Now, why is that important? One of the most important things that liberal theologians suggest about the resurrection 
is that the disciples of Jesus were so brokenhearted over losing him on the cross, and they were so desperate to see Jesus again, that they invented stories of resurrection. And some were so hopeful that he'd resurrect that they actually had visions of him in which they saw him alive. And as they had these visions, they began to tell other people about them. And the legend, like the Beatles' popularity in the 60s, began to grow. The problem with those views is that they don't measure up at all to the eyewitness accounts in any of the Gospels. The primary thing that you see in these stories in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is that resurrection is the furthest thing from anyone's mind. Each Gospel presents the women and the disciples running back and forth in shock and confusion. And even though Jesus has told them numerous times that we're going to Jerusalem, the Son of Man is going to be killed by the religious leaders, and he will rise again on the third day, even though he has told them specifically three times that that will happen. None of them can be described as remembering or believing those claims. In fact, there's great irony here. The only ones who seem to remember Jesus saying that are the chief priests and the Pharisees. Because in Matthew 27, we're told that they go to Pilate and ask for a group of soldiers to guard the tomb. And here's what they say. Sir, we remember how that imposter, Jesus, said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be more secu made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people, he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. So Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can. Meanwhile, though, while these guys remember that, the believers are not believing. John tells us in verse 19 that the disciples are meeting in a locked room because of their fear for the Jewish leaders. In Mark 16, 10 and 11, Mary Magdalene goes to tell the disciples that she has seen the Lord as they were mourning and weeping, Mark says. But when they heard from Mary that he was alive and had been seen by her, it says they would not believe her. Luke tells us that all the women joined in with Mary and came to the men, and it says the men did not believe them, but considered their words to be idle tales. Their version of our expression, an old wives' tale. But this is not an old tale. This is a bizarre tale. But they are convinced that Mary and the others saw the Lord. But nobody believes it. Nobody's thinking of a resurrection. Mark 16 says the two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus are deeply depressed because they thought he was the one to save Israel. But after Jesus reveals himself to them, they excitedly come back to the other disciples and say, he's alive. We talked to him. But it says... They didn't believe them either. In fact, Matthew tells us at the very end of his gospel, when he gives the Great Commission, when Jesus gives the Great Commission in Matthew 28, he gathers his men to get together to give him his last sermon. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. 
And Matthew tells us that most of these men are worshiping Jesus, but he inserts this. Even then, he says, some doubt it. This was the scene on Easter morning. It's chaos and confusion. Why is that important? It's because the idea of the resurrection being concocted by these guys who wanted it to be so, wanted it to be true so badly, it, it's totally contrary to what Scripture presents as what's really going on. No one is believing what has happened. And no one is expecting what is getting ready to happen. This leads us to the second thing about this first Sunday, this first day. Not only was it a day of chaos and confusion, but it becomes a day of confirmation and celebration. This now is Easter Sunday evening. If you look at verse 19, again, where Andy began reading, we see nothing but gloom and fear on the part of the disciples. They've been hearing stories from eyewitnesses all day, but they don't believe it. So they are locked down in gloom and fear. Evening has falling, fallen and they have locked the doors. And as we've said, Thomas is missing. Judas is missing, of course, because he's dead now. But even worse, they are sure that Jesus is also dead. But suddenly Jesus appears. He either comes through the locked door or he simply appears in their midst, it says. But either way, they are reminded, we're, we're reminded that his glorified body apparently could come right out of the grave clothes and he can come and go as he pleases. But he also is a man with flesh and blood and shows the wounds to Thomas and to the disciples as we'll see. In fact, this locked door doesn't mean anything to Jesus compared to the door of the tomb, the big stone, uh, being rolled away. Of course, uh, as Peter Marshall said, the stone was rolled away from the door not to permit Jesus to come out, but for, to enable the disciples to come in to inspect it. But Jesus has no problem with opening locked doors or coming out of grave clothes in his glorified body. So Luke tells us that they were talking about these things when G Jesus suddenly stood among them. He suddenly appeared, and it says, they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit or a ghost. It reminds us of when they were in the boat and Jesus comes walking on the water, and they freak out and think it's a ghost on the water. It's easy for us to laugh at them, but I've been up here at the church sometimes late at night, and suddenly somebody appears in the hallway, and I have almost screamed out like a girl. Uh, sorry, ladies, but I, it's the feminine side of me comes out, uh, and I think I'm seeing a ghost in the hallway. Eugene Peterson in the message says they were scared half to death. And that is very accurate. So then we find out Jesus does two things to encourage them. First, in verse 20, it says that he offers them shalom, peace. Peace be with you, he says. Now that's a typical Jewish greeting to this day. But in this case, it's much more than that. Actually, Jesus is fulfilling his own prophecy here. Just a few days earlier in chapter 14, 
15 and in chapter 16, his last talks with them in the upper room, he has predicted this very scene. And he's promised them peace in the midst of danger, persecution, and suffering. Look what he says in, in John 16. Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it is come. It's here. When you will be scattered, each of you to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have said these things to you. I've given you this heads up so that in me you may have shalom. You may have peace. Shalom to the Jewish person doesn't just mean a time when we're not at war. It means to have settledness, well-being inside of you. You're doing fine in spite of the circumstances. You're at peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus is offering this peace to them. And now he offers a second thing, his hands and his side for them to examine. Why is he doing this? Isn't that a bit crude? He tells them, take your fingers and stick them right here in my wounds that are three days old. They're still raw. He's in a glorified body, but he has his wounds, and he invites them to examine. Stick your hand in my side. Why is he doing that? He's doing it to give them and us evidence. This really happened. We know Thomas is going to demand this very same thing, but here he's offering it to the other ten as well. True faith is never divorced from evidence. This is very important for everyone here to understand. When you become a Christian, and when you begin to grow as a Christian, the Christian life is not a leap into the dark blindfolding yourself, saying, I hope this is right. It's what my mom and dad always taught me. It's what the preacher talked about down in the Bible Belt of Alabama. I'm just going to leap in the dark. No, this is a leap into the arms of the proven Messiah who's clearly designated in Matthew 1 with that long genealogy that he is Abraham's son, as promised. He is from the tribe of Judah, as promised. He's the, son of a, he's the son of David in the royal line. He's the king that is promised in, the, in David's covenant that he will rule and reign forever. And that long, boring genealogy comes down at a needlepoint on this one man. It's evidence. It's proven by over 60 to 70 prophecies that hit the bullseye. None of them come close to being unfulfilled. You can trust this man, this Messiah, but you can also trust that he said, I am coming like Isaiah 53 says, not just to be anointed as king, but I am coming to take your transgressions and be wounded and killed for you. And then Isaiah 53 goes on to say, he who has been killed will see his offspring. He will rejoice in those who come after him. How does a dead man do that? Isaiah 53 has a prophecy of resurrection in it in verses 11 and 12. You're not leaping into the dark with this man. You're leaping into the evidence that proves he is worthy of your life, of you following him, and of your death, following him to heaven. Jesus is showing his disciples this is no magic show here. And they will bear witness to their deaths. 
But they need to know now that this evidence is concrete. And so he says, stick your fingers in. Feel free. I want you to know it's real. After he offers them peace and his scars as evidence, we read that the disciples, it says, were glad when they saw the Lord. Now that may be the greatest understatement in the whole Bible right there. The ESV says they were glad when they saw the Lord. Other versions, the New American Standard uh, version says they rejoiced when they saw the Lord, and that's, that's a little more accurate. The NIV is even better. They were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. But again, the message may capture it best when it says, the disciples seeing the master with their own eyes were awestruck. That's the idea. It's not just like, well, I'm glad to be here tonight to see this. This is going from, he's dead, I don't believe you guys, to, oh my word, I'm awestruck. This is something that I can't even compute in my brain to, to handle this revelation that's happening in front of my eyes. That's what's going on. This day of chaos and confusion has become a time of confirmation and celebration. But that's not all. The next verse is 21 to 23. Look there, if you will. Because this is not just a day of confirmation and celebration, but it is a day of commissioning. It's a day of sending. What do we mean by that? Notice in verse 21 it says, Jesus first offers his peace to them again. Again, he's not just saying hello, guys. Rather, he is introducing a challenge to them. And he's assuring them that his peace will go with them to meet this challenge that he has for them. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, even so I am now sending you. This is our commission. It's one thing to know your apologetics and be able to defend your faith. That is assuring and encouraging for us. But that's not where it stops. It stops with us being a sent one, not just to defend, to defend the faith, but to share the faith. I am sending you just like I've been sent. This is what he uh, said in his prayer in John 17, verse 18. As you have sent me into the world, Father, I, so I have sent them into the world. Jesus has said this over and over again. The Father sent me, and I'm here to do his will. As we come to the end of this book, we've got two more, one more chapter, two more sermons. But as we come to the end of this, we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to take this wonderful gospel of John and put it up on the shelf with the other 65 books and chalk that one up? I've heard sermons on that. I've read that. It's a good book. Or do we see ourselves as commissioned by this gospel. You may say, along with me, well, that's not my strong suit. I can't talk to anybody. I just freeze up. Or I don't know what to say. What if they ask me some question I don't know? I'm not much of an evangelist. A lot of us can say that. But he doesn't give that to us as an option. He simply says, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you into the world. This is your commission. Go plant some seeds with someone outside the church building. Someone in the world. Before we say, I can't, notice what he offers us next. He doesn't just give the commission and say, get out there and give it your best shot. 
He offers us empowerment by the Holy Spirit as we carry out the commission. It says, after he gave this commission, it says, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a little confusing sometimes because in Acts 1.8, we're told that he tells the disciples, wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit and then you'll become my witnesses. And we know that the Spirit officially came down in the book of Acts at the day of Pentecost. But this seems to be a little preview of what's getting ready to happen. And he says, you need to do this not in your own strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, the word spirit is the same word for wind, that he tells Nicodemus about. And he says, Nicodemus, the wind, the word is pneuma, where we get our word pneumonia from, the wind in your lungs, the wind of the spirit blows Nicodemus wherever it wants. And I am coming to present myself as a sacrifice and but through the power of the Holy Spirit, lives are gonna be changed. And Jesus is now reminding his disciples, I'm not giving you a commission that some of you are good at and some of you are bad at. I'm not giving you a commission just for you to ramp up the best ability you have. I am giving you a commission to let the Holy Spirit use you. Receive the Holy Spirit. His work, his empowering through you. But not only that, but he goes on to say in the next verse, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. This is another phrase that sounds a little unusual. It sounds like the idea of a priest hiding behind a booth and having the power to either grant or deny forgiveness to someone who's in the other booth. But that's not the idea here. The basic idea of the Greek tense here is that this is someone who has been forgiven, it's the perfect tense, and they, or they have been withheld from forgiveness by your message. What he's saying is the gospel message will either bring people to forgiveness or if they reject it, they will be withheld from forgiveness. He is saying this commissioning that I'm giving you is not just something you do in your own power. It's not something you do with your own message. The message is the good news of the gospel that I came and died for their sins. I have risen to provide the proof that I'm not just a man dying, I am the son of God who's come to save them, to forgive them. You tell them that message in the power of the Spirit, that's your commission. And let God deal with forgiveness. This is a power-packed two or three verse sermon from Jesus about what our life's calling is as believers. It's convicting to me. It's challenging. But as we come to the end of this book, we all need to say, I want to defend the gospel, but I also want to share the gospel with those who are looking for forgiveness. That's our mission, our commission. This takes us to the following Sunday, the eighth day. This is when we meet up with Thomas again. In verses 24 to 25, it tells us that Thomas was not with them on Easter Sunday evening. Perhaps he had another commitment, or most likely he may have been too depressed or even afraid to gather with the others. 
Thomas seems to be a genuine introvert. And perhaps he just needed to be alone that night. But then we're told in verse 25 that he is emphatic in his refusal to believe. The others, it says in, in the language in Greek, is they keep telling him what they have seen. They keep telling him about last Sunday night. We saw him. He showed us his hands and his side all of his scars and invited us to touch him, Thomas. You got to believe us. But Thomas is emphatic to say, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and I see the marks of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. And the emphasis on those last words is, I will never, ever believe. That's the wrong slide, sorry. I've lost my, there we go. The last words are, I will never, ever believe this crazy story unless I see it firsthand. This is not just doubting, Thomas. This is stubborn unbelief. Maybe there's no hope for this guy. Or perhaps this is a sincere response of a practical and truthful man who will not be pressured or arm twisted into something so vital. Maybe he's not doubting as much as he is deliberate. We all have different personalities. Some of us will just believe anything anyone tells us, but Thomas is tough as nails in his decision about something so crucial. We might expect, um, well, I'm sorry, let me say this. It's with this in verse 26 that Jesus suddenly comes into the locked room again. When Thomas says this, I will never, ever believe. Verse 26 says, again, the doors were locked and Jesus came and stood among them. Boom, there he is. We might expect Jesus at this opportunity to take Thomas aside and let him have it. He's been on a cross. He's been on a cold tomb, in a cold tomb. And this guy has the nerve to say he won't believe until he sticks his finger into my bloody nail prints, into my side. How rude, how ungrateful. But this is where we say, see that the eighth day is a day of compassion. This day is a day of a second chance for Thomas. It's another opportunity. It's another mercy that Jesus gives him. Jesus doesn't rebuke him or chide him for missing the meeting or even for his refusal to believe. Instead, he begins with a third shalom. Peace to you, Thomas. I didn't come here to hammer you. I want you to have shalom. And the way you're going to get shalom is by dealing with the evidence. He delivers, he not only offers peace to Thomas, but then he offers to him like he did the other ten, his hands and his side. Jesus literally asked him, stick your hands in the raw wounds. We're not told whether Thomas actually does it. I tend to doubt it. I think he was probably a little embarrassed. Jesus' willingness, though, and the clear sight of his wounds is probably enough to bring Thomas down from his high horse. But Jesus means it with compassion. He's the one who said, consider the cost to some people that were interested in following him. He, he told the story of a man who begins to build, but he hasn't considered the cost, and he embarrasses himself when he can't complete the project. Thomas is considering the cost, and it's heavy. 
Jesus seems to respect his cautionary approach. This is compassion from the master. But he doesn't leave it there. It's also a day of confrontation. Notice what he does. Jesus has this uncanny ability to confront and to call for a decision and all the while be compassionate and understanding. We see this at the end of verse, er, er, in verse 27, at the end of the verse. It says, after the offer to stick his fingers and hands into his wound, Jesus says, Thomas, do not disbelieve, but believe. It's confrontation. Thomas, you have been not just doubting, you have been disbelieving. People are coming to you with evidence and you are refusing to, to see it. This is a challenge, a confrontation. He tells Thomas time for his decision. But notice his honesty here. He doesn't just say, come on, Thomas, believe. He tells him, you are disbelieving. He doesn't want him to have the hardness of heart in disbelief that they've seen in the Jewish leaders all the way through this story. He's calling Thomas to repentance. Turn around from this road of disbelief and get on the opposite road of belief. Go the opposite direction. And this next verse tells us that the eighth day becomes a day of confession. Thomas's confession right here is perhaps the most profound confession in all the Bible. In English, it's only five words, but they are profound. He doesn't say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, Jesus. He doesn't have to. He simply cries out an exclamation, my Lord and my God. God. He recognizes who Jesus is. The word Lord here is the word kurios, which is the Greek New Testament equivalent to Yahweh in the Old Testament. He looks into the eyes of his friend that he's been hanging around with for three years, for three years and says, Yahweh my Yahweh and my God. This is the most blasphemous thing that any Jewish person could ever say if it's not true. This is his confession that Jesus is God in the flesh. Something John's been telling us since the very first verse. He was in the beginning with God and he was with God, and he was God. He became flesh among us, and we beheld his glory. This is the climax of this book. This is his exclamation where he says, my Lord and my God. But look what Jesus says back to him. Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now let me just finish with this because I want this to encourage you and give you assurance, but also something we can share with others. When Jesus says this, a lot of times we think he's talking about the other ten guys. But no, they got to see the evidence too. He showed them his hands and his side and his feet. Who is he talking about who has not, believe, who has not seen but believed? He's talking about us. Thomas, this is great that you finally got it when you saw the evidence firsthand. But let me tell you something. There are a whole lot of believers coming down the road who will never see this firsthand. They're going to be 2,000 years down the road 
and they are going to believe it because of your testimony. And they will be truly blessed. That is the climax of this story. That is why John says the verse that we've used all the way through this. All of these other things I could have written, but I don't have room. But I've told you these stories so that in verse 21, uh, 31, these are written so that you, 2,000 years later, may believe, may commit your life to this man, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And not just so you can defend this, but so that by believing you have life in his name. Your whole life changes when you come to this man. This is the climax of the book. The evidence of Jesus' resurrection gives us assurance for ourselves, but it also gives us a sure message to share with others. The next two weeks we'll deal with chapter 21. Even though this is the climax, there's an epilogue at the end because we get to the end and we say, this is great about Thomas and all the other guys, but there's still a question. What about Peter? The last time we saw him, he denied Jesus and was crying his eyes out. Verse 21 is going to give us encouragement and assurance that even somebody who's blown it like Peter, but believes, has life in his name.